Isabel Archer, the heroine of Portrait of a Lady, was visiting England at the time of the conclusion of Henry James's novel. She plans to return to her husband in Rome, but their future together is uncertain, and James leaves his many readers wondering what happens next. Now, Booker Prize-winning author John Banville has picked up the story where the 1881 novel stopped in a sequel called Mrs. Osmond, and Publishers Weekly writes that it is a delightful tour de force that channels James with ease, a novel that succeeds both as an unofficial sequel and as a bold, thoroughly satisfying standalone. It's published by Knopf, and I'm very pleased it has brought John Banville back to our show. Welcome to the Green Space. Lovely to be here. You've written 17 novels that are often described as a master stylist. Was James an influence? Oh, a huge influence, yes, from the start. Book reviewers never seem to spot that. They say that I write like Nabokov or I write like Beckett or I write like whoever, but they never seem to see that Henry James was my main influence. A great uh, stylist, uh, one of the great modernists, took a different modernist direction. Which well, some say that James was the last Victorian novel, and others that he was the first modernist. Oh, he was the first modernist, definitely. He, he, it, James Joyce admitted that he, that his stream of consciousness, a term invented, by the way, by Henry's brother, William James, Joyce admitted that his stream of consciousness wasn't the way in which people think. But I feel that James's books are, certainly the, the last three, and even there are chapters in The Portrait of a Lady, which is... You can follow the, the, the heroine's mind thinking itself and stumbling. And this is the point about earlier fiction had people thinking clearly, but we don't think clearly. We, we stumble and we, we, we fight our way through a mist. And James's style, and especially his late style, is that mist. It's the mist of consciousness. You can only wonder what would have happened if James had written about contemporary American politics. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think maybe we won't go there. (laughs) Can can you give us a brief synopsis of the plot of Portrait of a Lady and what you had to work with? Isabel Archer is a uh, very independent, spirited, uh, brave, valorous young woman. She's only about 20 when we meet her first. She's in Albany. She's an orphan. Her Aunt Lydia arrives from, her fabulously wealthy Aunt Lydia arrives from Europe and says, I'm going to, to bring you back to the old world and turn you into European. Everybody throughout the book is trying to make something of Isabel Archer. Mm. She goes to England. She's proposed to by the fabulously wealthy Lord Warburton, who who seems to own half of England. Uh, She turns him down, of course. She's pursued by Caspar Goodwood, her lover from New England, from Boston. Her cousin, Ralph Touchett, who's dying, uh, persuades his father to give her half of his inheritance so she gets £17,000, uh, £70,000, a lot of money in those days. Not a huge fortune, but a fortune. And she is taken up by Madame Merle. Madame Merle is a wonderful creation, uh, wicked, charming, polished, delightful, uh, but wicked. <laughs> and she essentially marries her off to... Gilbert Osmond. And Gilbert Osmond is Big American. Mistake. Gilbert Osmond, American, living in Florence, a dilettante, uh, but a sterile creature, and she makes a great mistake by marrying him. And would James have written, as you do, that Isabel Archer had married the perfectly wrong person? Oh, yes. I mean, James, James had a wonderfully, finely developed sense of evil. Mm-hmm. Not the evil of, you know, genocide and horrors like that, of just the ordinary, everyday evil of how people prey on each other, how they take each other's freedom away. I mean, for James, I think this was the greatest sin, to deprive another human being of his or her freedom. And all the people surrounding Isabel are intent on taking away her freedom, her freedom to live, her freedom to, as he says wonderfully, to affront her for her fortune. Because they see her as an American, as someone who has to be shaped? Well, her Aunt Lydia sees her as somebody to be shaped. Ralph Touchett, her cousin, who gives her all this money, he wants to see her perform. Uh, Gilbert Osmond wants to get her money. Uh, He quite likes her, and I think at the start he may even love her in his loveless way. 
Madame Merle wants to get a dowry for her daughter, whom she has secretly had with Gilbert Osmond. Isabel knows none of this. Mm -hmm. All the enlightenment that Isabel uh, gets comes in the last 20 or 30 pages of the novel, which fairly gallop along. But then it stops dead. And James himself said about the portrait of a lady that it's, of course, the chief criticism of it is that it's not finished. He liked it that way. He liked to leave it ambiguous. I thought I would finish it for him. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't, in a way, because I had planned at the end of my book that she would meet a, a, a really good, free-thinking, tolerant, liberal American or English man, and that they would go to the new world and she would there affront her fate, affront her destiny. Uh, but, of course, when I got to the end of the book, I realized I couldn't do it that way. So it ends ambiguously. So I'm hoping that somebody else, preferably a woman, will write the third volume. This could go on for a long time. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is a part of the genius of Henry James to invent these superb characters, this superb story, the superb predicament. Um, so yes, it could go on. Did it you? Beca it could become a box set. Did you try to duplicate Henry? <laughs> Sorry, I stepped on that line. Um, <laughs> did you try to duplicate Henry James's style by using long interior monologues? It was a very strange process. I f didn't know if I could do it. My wife years ago had urged me to, you know, finish off the book, do the second half of it. I at that time didn't think I could do it, but then in an access of foolhardiness and overweening egomania, I thought, yes, I will do it. Um, when I started to write, I didn't know if I could. I sat down one morning and began to write. And you know, this is a strange thing about writing a book. There is a point at which you have to put the pen on the paper and write the first sentence and the first line and the first paragraph. And I found that it flowed uh, far more easily than I expected it to. I wrote it in the space of about a year. Usually my books take two, three, four, even five years to write. So, and I sometimes felt, I wrote a lot of it in Chicago last fall when I was there for a couple of months. And uh, I was on, living on campus, so I had nothing much else to do except work all day. And I sometimes felt that I could get up and move away from the table and make a cup of coffee, and I'd come back, and there would be two or three more paragraphs written. Do you like changing your personas uh, with different kinds of novels. You, uh, you in your other writings uh, life as the detective novelist Benjamin Black, you write action, filled crime fiction. Uh, and then you've also written a Philip Marlowe novel called The Black-Eyed Blonde, uh, written kind of in the style of, of Raymond Chandler. Oh, not kind of in the style, in yeah. the style. Okay, and then, and then you Very have your own, then you have your own novels and the voice has changed there as well. Well, I, my old friend John McGarren, a wonderful Irish novelist, uh, he's left us now, uh, he ha had a wonderful distinction he used to make. He used to say that there's verse and there's prose and then there's poetry. And poetry can happen in, a, in either medium. And since he was a prose writer, he said it happens more often in prose, of course. Van Bond tries to be that kind of prose poet. Um, don't ask me what I expect the, the results to be, because I don't know. I work in darkness, and I don't know what I'm doing. Benjamin Black is a craftsman, and he makes these uh, these pieces of, I hope, well-made and honestly made craft work. As to where my Henry James voice came from, I just don't know. They do say, there's a theory in, in, in you know, psychologists now say that when we have a task to do which is, in, which is vaguely in our own area but is not specific to what we do, that we're able to induce ourselves into a kind of, induce a state of hypnosis in which we, we don't realize we're in the state of hypnosis, but we do that particular task. And I think that's, I think I was in a state of hypno self-hypnosis for about a year. Raymond Chandler and Henry James are quite different stylists. Uh, what drew you to those authors in particular? Well, I've, I mean, Chandler, I think, is a wonderful writer. Uh, he goes a little bit over the top every now and then. Those those metaphors. Yeah, those metaphors are a bit wearing. But when he's, his narrative, his command of direct narrative uh, 
prose is is superb. It's matched only by Georges Simenon. He can set a scene in a line or two. Uh, that was what attracted me to it. Because, you know, Simenon or Chandler can, can set a scene in, in, in a line. There's a Simenon book that opens with, I can't remember which one, and it says, the commuter crowd were all coming out of the railway station. She was the only one going in. And you're there. Mm. You're just absolutely there. And that would take me three pages to write. <laughs> I'm speaking to John Banville, whose latest novel is Mrs. Osmond, published by Alfred A. Knopf. Uh, he is the author of 17 novels. Uh, his novel, The Sea, won the Booker Prize in 2005. Uh, and then 10 crime novels as Benjamin Black. Have I covered them all? Yes, I wish people would stop saying that. I feel as if people are saying he has seven, 17 indictments for, <laughs> for you know, <laughs> crime. Um, <laughs> I, I'm compulsive. I can't stop writing. I've, somebody once asked Iris Murdoch why did she write so many books, and she said, "I feel that the new one will exonerate me from all the ones <laughs> that have gone before," <laughs> and that's my feeling as well. That this time I'll get it right. How should someone who hasn't read Portrait of a Lady approach reading Mrs. Osmond? You don't have to have read Portrait of a Lady. I was very gratified. I spoke to two, three people who hadn't read Portrait of a Lady who read Mrs. Osmond and said. I understood it. I didn't need to know what had gone before. But of course, it would be enriched if you were to reread or read for the first time uh, Portrait of a Lady because it's one of the greatest novels. It's certainly the greatest novel of the 19th century, I think. So you can only gain by going back to read it. Isn't much of a Portrait of a Lady driven by the marriage plot? Who will this fiercely independent young woman settle down with? And she does seem to uh, uh, appeal to every man she meets. Uh, but is, is the marriage of Isabel and Gilbert Osmond a classic mismatch? Why did Henry James do that to her? Because he's a novelist, <laughs> and that's what novelists do. Well, she turns uh, down much better matches. No, she didn't. Lord Warburton would have made her bend to his will in just the same way that Gilbert Osmond does. If she'd married Caspar Goodwood, the wool and wool cotton magnate from Boston or whatever. He would have done exactly the same thing. Isabel is, I mean, I regard The Portrait of Lady as a very great feminist novel. And Isabel is a feminist heroine. She doesn't know it because she's not old enough. I mean, she's very young. I think Henry James forgot that at the end of The Portrait of a Lady, she was still only about 29, if my calculations are right. So she's still young. She still has a life ahead of her. But She's not going to marry, she, she's wise enough in her youth to know that what's being offered to her is not that great ample life that she wishes to lead. What's being offered to her is a steel trap. And at the end of my book, which I planned, as I said, to end, that she would meet somebody nice and go off to America, she recognizes again in a plausible young man, there's another trap. And the trap may be lined with velvet, but it's still a steel trap. Now you have a number of the characters you've, you've brought back from the James novel, but you've introduced a few, including uh, Miss Florence Janeway. Uh, she's politically active and objects to being called a suffragette. Well, suffragette was a, was a, was a term of abuse, a term of mockery that journalists uh, used at the time. I mean, the word is suffragist. It's insulting because it ends with et. It could have been a suffragette. Yeah, yeah, they were making fun of them. They were saying, you know, suffragettes. Have you seen the movie? Yes, I saw it. I liked it. Uh -huh. I think it's a good movie. And it's you, did a, you it's think, a, what do you think about the casting? I think it was very good. I think Nicole Kidman is, is good. She's, she has that nervy, um, that nerviness that, that Isabel needs. Well, the minute we see John Malkovich, we know that this is a bad mistake. Oh, my, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that was the role that Malkovich was born to play. He even looks like <laughs> Gilbert Osmond. Tonight at 8, uh, John Banville will appear for a joint reading with Claire Massoud with introductions by Colin McCann and Liesl Schlesinger at the 92nd Street Y. That's at 1395 Lexington Avenue at 92nd Street. And the book, the latest from uh, John Banville, the Booker Prize winning author, uh, is... Mrs. Osmond. It is published by Knopf. You didn't mention that she might have found a, a suitable Irish suitor. 
No, no, Henry James, <laughs> even though his, he family, have allowed that. his family came from Ireland, he, he visited Dublin briefly and sort of left it kicking the dust of Ireland from his heels. Uh, thank you so much for being on our show. WNYC is supported by...